Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Erich Reed, and I'm the director of the Southwest Harbor Public Library. Two new services that we rolled out this month are a daily pass to the New York Times, including the Cooking and Games apps, and also the Libby Reading and Listening app that complements our robust collection of ebooks and audiobooks on Cloud Library. And next week, we're going to host a hybrid event with Carolyn Ball on how nonprofits work. Um, there are over 150 of them on Mount Desert Island and nearby islands, including the Southwest Harbor Public Library. And we all offer a diverse range of uh, services to our community. Uh, before introducing Margie, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. We'll be recording this event, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them for, in the chat feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll direct them uh, at the end of the presentation. If there's a few short time sensitive questions, we might be able to work those into uh, Margie during the presentation as well. At the end, um, if you wanna ask your question direct, you can raise your hand via the feature and we can ask you to unmute and you can ask that directly. Otherwise, I'll help assist with that. Margie Patlack is a science writer, a memoirist, and a photographer, and her personal essays and articles have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Post, and Discover Magazine. Her photographs have appeared in solo and group exhibits in Maine and in private collections. She has degrees in botany and environmental science studies and divides her time between Philadelphia and Korea, Maine. We last hosted her for a wonderful event as she shared her memoir, More Than Meets the Eye, Exploring Nature and Loss on the Coast of Maine. Uh, please welcome Margie Patlack. Thank, thanks, Erich, for that uh, nice introduction. And, and thanks for inviting me to speak tonight at the library about my new photo book, Wild and Wondrous, and about my photography on the fly process. I titled my talk Photography on the Fly because most of the pictures in the book were taken while I was either hiking, biking, kayaking, skiing, skating, or balancing on uh, slippery seaweed covered rocks. Um, and so today what I'm gonna do is uh, tell you what inspired the book. And then I'll talk a little bit about my photography on the fly process and how it was enabled by a point and shoot and an iPhone and why I feel those are particularly suited for nature photography. And then I'll give you a visual tour of the book uh, featuring photos from each of its uh, 10 chapters. All right, so first for the inspiration, what could be more inspiring than the, the nature in, in Maine? Um, I took this uh, picture on the beach in Korea, Maine, and uh, for more than a decade, my husband and I had the good fortune to spend our summers and our uh, shoulder seasons on um, the, the uh, um, Gouldsboro Bay, which is in Korea, Maine. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's uh, Korea spelt with a, a C. <laughs> And it's, it's located on the Scudic Peninsula, which is about an hour's drive uh, further north than um, uh, Bar Harbor. And my husband and I also ha uh, spent the first entire year of the pandemic uh, on uh, at our, our place on the bay in Korea, Maine. So I got to experience uh, the winter there as well. And every time I returned to Philadelphia and its cityscape where we wintered, I longed for those uh, awe-inspiring moments of natural beauty that I experienced in Maine. Um, I found that they uh, disrupted my, my uh, natural frame of reference and kind of restored a childlike sense of awe about the world. So wanting to capture those uh, wonderful moments, I... Um, I started carrying a camera with me wherever I went in Maine and snapped away. Uh, now, mind you, I started uh, photography back in the dark ages when I was in college. So I just had one of those big bulky cameras with the lots of lens changes, no automatic focusing. And to edit my photos, my only option was uh, the dark room that I set up. So it had its, its own limitations. Uh, but when we started spending time in Korea, that's about the time that these newer point-and-shoot and, shoot and um, 
uh, iPhone cameras were becoming so good that the professionals were even using it along with the digital photo editing software, which was also becoming quite good. And, and, and that enabled you to do everything that um, you can do in a darkroom only more. So um, I, I essentially started with the point and shoot when I started taking photos in Maine. Um, and then I quickly switched to just using my iPhone such that nearly all the photos that you see here tonight and in my photo book were taken with an iPhone. Now I find these compact cameras um, to be especially useful for nature photography for a number of reasons. First of all, they require no time consuming lens changing, framing and focusing. And timing is everything when you're trying to capture fleeting moments like this. It's not like the fog is gonna stop for me while I change a lens or you know, a butterfly is gonna pose while I carefully frame a picture. Um, so, you know, it, a, a camera you can quickly pull out of your back pocket and, and snap a picture with is, is a real advantage, I think, in many cases, because there's very few things in nature that stand still. I mean, even trees, they stand still, but the lighting may change or something. So you, you need to capture things as quick as you can. Um, I think the, the, the these a camera that you can pull out of your back pocket you know, that's nice and compact is also useful when you're trying to go and reach um, hard to reach areas like this one. This was taken on the Gouldsboro Bay and um, to, I had to walk over lots of slippery mud and seaweed to get to it. And, and I'll show you right now what I walked over. <laughs> so um, you can um, maybe see that in the very uh, far distance is my house. So I never would have attempted this with a bulky camera nor would I have brought a big bulky camera up to the top of Penobscot Mountain in Acadia where I took this picture. I also wouldn't have brought it on my kayak. So I, I uh, soon became a firm believer in this uh, ma mantra that the best camera to have is the one that fits in your back pocket and is always with you. I heard this at a nature photography uh, workshop and it really resonated with me. I'm, first of all, you know, my hiking buddies on the left wouldn't have bothered to wait for me while I carefully framed uh, a photo um, or changed a lens. And it's a lot safer to have a little uh, camera when you're taking pictures perched on the edge of the cliff, like I am here on the right. Uh, that photo, by the way, is taken by my friend, Rosemary Levin. All right, so now I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit of, about my uh, process. Um, so basically what I do is some, something catches my eye that I think might make an interesting picture. And it prompts me to take a bunch of pictures of it in succession from different angles and perspectives. So here you see me in the blueberry barrens around uh, Cherryfield, Maine in the fall. And I'm um, Rosemary took this picture as well. And I'm, I'm kneeling on the ground there uh, to take the picture, but I also you know stood up and took many uh, pictures from different perspectives and I held the camera vertically and I held it horizontally and it it really isn't until I um, get home that I choose uh, or figure out what picture will make will be the best one and, and to do that I I uh, frame um, uh, in it in different ways you know I crop in different ways to figure out what the best focal point is and sometimes to figure that out I also change it uh, to a black and white photograph if it's color just to see the basic structure and then I'll, I'll um, after cropping I'll change it back into color um, but <clears throat> the end result of this is that I spend most of my time deleting my photos I probably keep less than 10 percent of them Another uh, thing uh, is that I'm quick on the draw, so, which requires me to be quick on the feet. And so here I am in a picture taken by my friend Terry Weingrad where I'm um, in my bathrobe and muck boots because I didn't want to take the time to get dressed so so I could capture the, the wonderful interplay of the fog coming in with the sun rising. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, timing is everything. All right, so in the process of, of um, taking all these photos, I found that nature reveals 
her remarkable designs, not just on a grand scale with her stormy seascapes like this one, but also on the small scale with a clamshell capturing the sunlight. Or an even smaller scale uh, with uh, these dog whelk eggs the size of cantaloupe seeds attached to the rock and, and you can see barnacles behind them. Um, all three of these photos that I just showed you were taken with the various models of the iPhone uh, just to show you the range of what you can do with it. And I think the last one, this one, was taken with an iPhone 12 model and of course now they're up to 15. So Wild and Wondrous was a result of all my attempts to capture the ephemeral and imprint on paper something much more profound. Um, I really do feel like nature is the ultimate artist and I'm just her scribe trying to share her wonders. So like uh, Rachel Carson once did of her readers, I ask you, drink in the beauty and think and wonder at the meaning of what you see. Okay, now I'll give you a little tour of the book, which has over 200 photos and um, 10 chapters in it. And uh, at the beginning of each chapter, there's a brief written introduction because even though I'm a writer, I do also believe in that mantra, which is that a picture says more than a thousand words. So this picture I took on the Gouldsboro Bay um, and it's in my uh, first chapter where light is really the main subject because photography literally means writing with light. And um, of course, any photographer knows that some light makes better pictures than others. So this morning light is especially good as well as the uh, late afternoon light. And because Maine is so far north, it has a as a certain slant of light, as Emily Dickinson would say, that when it's uh, mixed with fog and other atmospherics can make for some really ethereal looking photos. Um, and, you know, a break in the clouds and the fog can add drama to a picture like it does here. And here, uh, <laughs> You can see that um, a low-lying beam of sun is spotlighting a, a young tree. <laughs> and here, a break in the clouds is highlighting an island. And low-lying beams here are transferring uh, ferns or jellyfish into something much more luminous. And the early morning light can uh, here is giving a wonderful warm glow that is um, accented, of course, by the, the fact that I took this, uh, the Gouldsboro Bay, in the fall when uh, the grasses had already started to turn that nice yellow color. All right, now we'll move on to my next chapter, which is on islands. Um, I, I There are like more than 2,000 islands in Maine. And um, what... Um, what I love about them is how they just magically appear and disappear along with the tides. So this is taken on a beach in Korea, Maine, and um, you'll see people are walking out to the island. We have a natural land bridge that forms there, and it only lasts for about an hour. But if you're lucky enough to, to get out there, um, it's, it's just, uh, it's like being on another planet. Um, there are these big boulders that look like beached whales and cobbles, and it's kind of denuded of vegetation except for a few um, patches of trees here and there. Um, and of course, there's always that intrigue of a main island with only one house that kind of invites these fantasies of living the solitary life. Uh, this one I took of Petit Manan uh, from a friend's sailboat. And this one of an island and a solitary house was taken uh, off the coast of Addison, Maine. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of Maine, I think of rocks. Um, you know, it's the whole coastal part of the state is just covered with rocks, whether they are the, you know, the wonderful rounded cobbles that you can see here on the left or the, or the, um, you know, big uh, square edged uh, blocks of granite that make up the mountains and, and form uh, slabs here and there throughout the, uh, the, the shoreline. That granite ha um, tends to break at right angles. 
And um, here on the left, you can see how a tidal pool sort of accents this. And uh, I call this a photo Mondrian in rock. And on the right hand um, are some basalt stones, which my uh, nephew has carefully lined up their quartz uh, lines in to uh, create his own sort of artistry. And here's some nice slabs of granite on the Korea beach. And these are uh, wonderful um, uh, black dikes that are made from black basalt uh, percolating up in between uh, granite. And it's they're really common on the Skuta Peninsula and very striking. Um, and, uh, you know, I just love the way they look. All right. Um, well, you can't have a book about Maine without a book, a, a chapter about fog. So that's my next chapter I'm going to share with you. Um, this was taken on the Korea beach. And um, even though I really did get, a, I must admit, a little sick of the fog after we had six of weeks of it last summer, pretty much nonstop, I do love what fog does to pictures. Um, for one thing, it can remove the... Um, horizon line, which is which is really, um, you know, how we make sense of our world. So without it, 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 it sort of makes you stumble and, and visually and, and think about things a little more. It sort of creates a confusing new reality. And this picture was taken on the Gouldsboro Bay. Fog can also highlight things in the foreground and make you notice them more uh, by sort of hiding things in the background. Uh, like it's doing here. This picture I took in Sullivan, Maine, off of Route 1. Fog can also create floating trees, as it's doing here on the Korea beach. Or it can create visual echoes um, by uh, creating this fainter version of an island behind the one that's uh, featured uh, more in, in focus. Uh, I think this was also taken in Korea. And look how alluring and magical the bubbles in Jordan Pond look like when they're in, uh, wreathed in fog. Um, although I don't think you'll see a photo like this in their, their uh, uh, shop. Another thing that I love about fog is the way it decorates vegetation and spider webs and really makes you appreciate their intricacy and their design. Okay, now we're moving on to my chapter on clouds. Um, Maine, the coast of Maine, like all coasts, gives birth to clouds and uh, its wide open spaces on the shoreline uh, enable you to see them. So once I started spending a lot of time um, on the coast of Maine, I, I started to really appreciate the, uh, the diversity of, of the patterns and shapes of the clouds. I think uh, one of my favorite clouds are these lenticular clouds that you can see here. They're the ones that look like flying spaceships and you see it in this picture above the puffy cumulus clouds. Lenticular clouds tend to form over mountains, but they can also form over uh, cumulus clouds as well. Although most people seem to prefer clouds at dawn or dusk because they give the beginnings and ends of our days a, a kind of golden grandeur, um, I think I took this picture at about five in the morning. And uh, when I mentioned that in posting it on Instagram, my uh, friend Becky responded, um, well, no wonder you're up so early with that kind of beauty. You wouldn't want to miss out on any of it. And I, I tend to agree with her. Okay, so another thing that I think is unique about Maine is it's, uh, it has so many abrupt intersections, whether they're between water and land or forest and shore, mountains and sea. Um, and of course, Maine's dramatic 13-foot uh, tides can create constantly shifting intersections. Um, I like to tell people that I got two landscapes for the price of one because um, when our place on the bay looks completely different, whether it's uh, low tide or high tide. So one of my chapters in my book is called Intersections and Tides. And um, these pictures are in it, and they were taken at uh, Raven's Nest in Scudic Acadia. 
And this uh, picture that was taken from the top of Beach Mountain, I think nicely illustrates how close the um, ocean is to the forest and the mountains. And of course, um, you know, when you have these abrupt and constantly shifting interactions, you get uh, strange bedfellows uh, because the terrestrial mixes with the oceanic. So here on the left, you can see a, a piece of seaweed that got snagged um, by some uh, grasses in the marsh, some sedges. And then on the right, you can see uh, a sea urchin that's uh, nestled on a bed of crowberry. Um, what I think about the tides uh, uh, that makes uh, life interesting is the way it, it creates two personalities of the um, seaweed that's everywhere on the shore. So here you can see our bay at low tide, um, the Goldsboro Bay. And then, um, you know, so at that time, the seaweed is just kind of listless and it just kind of drapes over the rocks. But contrast that to this, which was taken at high tide from um, a kayak. And you can see that the seaweed just dances lovely, lovely in uh, the water. Um, <clears throat> Maine also has a number of diverse habitats, um, bogs and heaths, mountains and forests, bays and shorelines. And each habitat has their own set of flora and fauna. So another uh, chapter in my book uh, is about flora and fauna. And of course, it's pretty a long one. I think it's the longest one because of that diversity. Um, this is a picture of the blueberry barrens in the fall. And um, they were actually created as a parting gift from the glaciers who left behind these boulders and gravel that make the perfect growing conditions for the blueberries who turn, uh, and their leaves turn a wonderful, um, you know, color shades of red and, and uh, orange in the fall. Uh, the glaciers also scooped out uh, some depressions in the rock that created heaths and bogs. Um, this picture was taken at the Korea heath, and you can see some cotton grass in the foreground there. That uh, heath also harbors uh, pitcher plants that you can see on the left. Um, they're interesting because they're insectivorous. So they um, cup the water, their leaves cup water and uh, any insect that's um, unfortunate enough to slip down into that pool of water will get digested by the acids that are uh, that the plant makes there um, so that it can eat the, the insects because uh, the nutrient level in the um, wetlands that it has is, isn't sufficient for it to survive. Um, so it needs those extra insect nutrients. And on the right, you can see a um, wild orchid that blooms there. It's usually in bloom at the beginning of June, I think, or mid-June. And um, they're kind of on the small side, so you have to kind of look for them carefully. Uh, because most of Maine is forested, including our property, uh, my the insects really appreciate the oasis of uh, nectar and pollen that my garden provides. So a lot of my pictures are of insects and and uh, actually I'm currently working on a book of insects because of that. Um, so on the left, you can see a uh, bumblebee on my Veronica. And on the right, you can see a fritillary butterfly on my um, coneflower. Uh, some people confuse the fritillaries with monarch butterflies because they're somewhat similar in color, although the monarch is black and orange and the fritillary is um, uh, more of a brownish and orange and has a different checkerboard pattern. But speaking of monarchs, on the left, you see a, uh, a caterpillar, the monarch caterpillar that's on my um, butterfly weed in my garden. And uh, this is a caterpillar that I, I took and plucked from my garden so I could watch it uh, undergo that remarkable transformation into a chrysalis, which you can see in the, the center here. Um, they're so... It's, it's an amazing process to watch and it doesn't really harm the insect if you do it. I, you, you know, I just took it in, put it in a jar um, and uh, the, I didn't actually get to see it form the chrysalis because it did it overnight, but um, I did get to see the rest of it. So like two weeks later, after it forms the chrysalis, right before the butterfly emerges, the chrysalis gets uh, translucent and you can see the butterfly wing like um, you see here on the right. And then of course, once the butterfly comes out, 
it sits motionless for a while because it has to um, pump fluids and to pump plump out its wings and, and have them dry. So that's the one case where something in nature actually poses for me for a while and I take advantage of it. This is a porcupine that's walking down the road in our development. Um, the porcupines are overpopulated on this Goudic Peninsula because of lack of their predators, their natural predators, the fishers that were overhunted. So consequently, you know, they have nothing to fear and you can frequently see them ambling around or up in the trees. Um, oftentimes tourists will stop and uh, say, you know, what is that animal up in the tree? And I love the look of awe and wonder that they get when I tell them it's, a, it's an actual wild porcupine. Um, Foxes also uh, like to trot alongside the road because that's where they can easily find their prey. Um, for those of you who read my book, More Than Meets the Eye, this was the fox that I described taking pictures of in my chapter, Outfoxed. And I was amazed at how closely it let me get because I didn't have a telephoto lens to take this shot. Also in that book, I described the uh, spotted salamander eggs that I, I saw on uh, in the temporary pools that form along the roadside ditches in the early spring. The spotted salamander is pretty elusive and hard to see because it's nocturnal, um, but you can often find uh, its eggs in the early spring, like I would say between a April and maybe beginning of June. And what's really neat about them is that um, they have a wonderful symbiotic relationship with uh, green algae. So the, um, the algae photosynthesizes and gives it the embryos the oxygen it needs. And in return, um, the um, embryos uh, provide waste for the algae. So the algae are actually embedded in with the embryo cells. And when they hatch into salamanders, eventually those photosynthetic um, cells will disappear, but until then they're considered the only known uh, vertebrate animal that photosynthesizes, which I think is pretty cool. Um, here are the wild roses that are common in Maine and uh, I just love the, their scents. So I, whenever I bike or hike by them, um, if I don't literally stop to smell the roses, I, I certainly you know sniff deeply. <laughs> And tidal pools have their own interesting patterns that I adore. Um, uh, the picture on the right and the left were both taken through the water of tidal pools. The one on the left you can see is predominantly filled with mussels. The one on the right has uh, barnacles and lichen on the rock and a few mussels. And of course there's periwinkles on both of them. And then in the middle you can see rockweed, which is uh, found everywhere on the shore. Now, sometimes um, you're not fortunate enough to see the animal, but you are fortunate enough to see what they left behind. So in this case, on the left, that's a big square hole that a pileated woodpecker has carved out in the birch uh, trunk. Uh, pileated woodpeckers are those really big ones that I think woody woodpeckers modeled after with the big uh, red heads. And then on the right, you can see the claw of a uh, crab that was left behind on the cobbles on the shore. Um, this picture on the left here is of an autumn meadow hawk, hawk uh, dragonfly that I took in November. They they are around late in the season then, um, surprisingly, but they do have to uh, warm themselves in the morning when it's so cold. So this one I took on a hike in the early morning and it was um, warming itself up on a rock. And on the right, you can see a grasshopper eating some uh, sea lavender on the bay. Now this guy, I wasn't sure how close to get <laughs> to. Um, I was sitting on the bay having my coffee in the morning and, and it crept out of the forest and it just kept going closer and closer to me and I kept taking pictures. Uh, but then at a certain point, I thought, well, how close do I want to get to this guy? Because I remembered my cat getting uh, skunked uh, and... Uh, that horrible smell that lasted for months afterwards, and I didn't want that to happen to me. But um, I've, I've since heard that that skunks can be really tame and that they only spray you when they feel threatened in some manner. All right, now we'll move on to my chapter on forests because I had to have a chapter on that since Maine is 90% forest. Um, 
And even though those forests are mostly filled with evergreens like um, pines and firs and uh, spruces and, and uh, cedars, there are also a number of um, uh, deci deciduous trees like maples and aspens and birches that create a colorful palette in the fall and offer some nice contrast like you can see here from the top of Beach Mountain where I took this photo. Um, another thing that's distinct about the, the uh, uh, forests in Maine are um, the boulders that are everywhere. So these uh, boulders were left behind by the glaciers and they're called glacial erratics. And one of my favorite poems is by the local poet, Carl Little, and it's called Glacial Erotic because in that poem, he describes making out with his girlfriend in high school behind one of these uh, boulders. And it's, I think it's really remarkable the way the trees can just overcome those obstacles, you know, grow around them, on top of them, in between them. And um, I love the way um, the, these two cedar trees are shaking hands here in the in the middle. It looks like, of course, um, the 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 trees and the boulders paint just part of the majesty of the main forest. Uh, there, it also has an endless carpet of mosses and lichens uh, that are uh, quite diverse and and beautiful on their own right. They grow right up um, the trees sometimes. <laughs> And then we have all these uh, colorful fungi that grow on the trees, uh, the tree trunks. So on the left, you can see um, lungwort. In the middle is uh, turkey tails. And on the right is uh, something called witch's butter. And then of course, we also have uh, a nice selection of colorful mushrooms to brighten our hikes. Um, and some are end up on the dinner plates of those who are brave, although um, I don't think any of these are edible. One of my favorite um, plants in the forest is uh, are these um, ghost pipes. Uh, you see they're really pale because like fungi, they, they don't um, photosynthesize and get their nutrients from the floor of the forest. Um, and they're actually, these are the flowering stalks and they're actually close cousins of the blueberry plants. And if you look closely and imagine those flowering stalks being greener and the flowers being white, you could see how they do resemble um, blueberry flowering stalks quite a bit. Now, uh, some plants like these uh, ferns and uh, bunchwood only grow uh, in the forest where there's a little more light, like on the edges of paths or where there's a, a down tree. Okay, now we're going to move on to my chapter on ice. Um, so the winter we spent up in Korea, I really appreciated all the awe-inspiring beauty that is engraved in frozen water. Um, I know a lot of Mainers don't really like the cold long winters and uh, the storms and the damage that they can produce. Um, and, I, and my uh, sympathies go out to many of you who experienced that damage personally be because the last set of storms we had were so destructive. But um, the one winter I was there, I just really appreciated how cold changed the landscape and gave me new photographic opportunities. So an example of that is how the um, the ice solidified the dance of the sea into frozen fragments that you can see here on the left on the marsh grasses. And on the right, um, the uh, the ice showcases stream bubbles that got caught inside it at a, at a local stream. On the left here, there are um, pancakes of ice that form on the cobbles at low tide, and these usually uh, disappear by high tide. And on the right, you can see the, the final flow of a stream trickling amongst the rocks on the shoreline. I took this picture while skiing on uh, Eagle Lake, and I think what um, drew, drew me to it was the way those windblown trees look like billowing sails, of, except uh, instead of uh, being on the sea, this boat was uh, on a sea of snow. <laughs> um, snow has a its own crystal and magic, especially when it's a light snowfall and it outlines um, all the the uh, branches of the trees like it does here on the bottom right, um, or it provides a nice white backdrop so you can appreciate what's there on the forest floor. 
It can also reveal uh, the tracks of others still active in the area. Um, like um, on the left here, on the upper left, you can see the tracks that a raccoon left in some ice. In the bottom right, those are the trails um, that the mice uh, took through snow. So mice actually live in snow in winter and they create all these intricate tunnels. And um, when the snow starts to melt in the spring, that's when you start to see these, these patterns of their tunnels. And on the bottom left, you'll see a, 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 a I call it a snow egg that, that naturally uh, formed um, in a nest. And on the upper right is a friend of mine making his own tracks on Charcot Pond in Korea. I found that the uh, winter in Maine was surprisingly colorful. Uh, prior to it, we'd had a very um, extended drought. So the uh, mosses and lichens had gotten kind of dried up and brown looking. But as soon as we got the precipitation in winter, whether it was rain or snow, they they perked up and um, were quite vibrant, as you can see here. And I discovered um, from doing a little research that some mosses and pitcher plants remain active in for parts of the winter if it's not too cold. All right, now uh, we're moving on to my final chapter, which is on uh, reflections. Um, and uh, Maine has lots of opportunities for, for uh, reflections with all its um, you know, bodies of water from the bogs to the lakes to the bays to the ponds. Um, and I like the way reflections make you pause and prompt you to observe more closely the, the scenery. Um, this one was taken on a kayak ride out of Bass Harbor on Mount Desert Island. And reflections can just be wonderfully discombobulating, like how often you get to see trees extending into water, like you see here, or reeds in the sky, or two suns. Calm water uh, can give symmetry to re a reflection that can give you a sense of peace to a photo like, like you see here. But then if there's a little bit of a breeze, it ripples the water and, and creates a more impressionistic version of the scenery, like a Monet painting. This uh, picture was of uh, Jordan Pond. So all these tricks of light stimulate the mind as you try to make sense of the ordinary turned extraordinary. And I think stirs a profound sense of awe and appreciation of, of nature's artistry. Okay, so here are both of my books, which they're both available at the Southwest West Harbor Library, as well as many other uh, libraries. And um, they're also available at uh, uh, various bookstores. I know that uh, Sherman's has them both in stock now in uh, Bar Harbor. And um, on the Skudik Peninsula, the Winter Harbor Five and Dime are, is currently selling them. And of course, when um, the weather gets a little warmer and the galleries open up there on the peninsula, the, um, artisans and antiques and uh, works of hand in Winter Harbor and chapter two in Korea will also be selling the books. And if you want to uh, order them online, you can go to uh, bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores or amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com, which doesn't. Or you can um, just go to your local bookstore and if they don't have it in stock, just ask them to order it and they should be able to do that uh, easily. Um, okay, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. If you if you uh, would like to see more of my writing or photos, I encourage you to go to my website. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And um, I thank you for your attention. And and um, also, I thank uh, Kate for making sure that this all went well, technically. <laughs> and uh, now I welcome your questions. So if anyone has any questions and they want to ask them themselves, they can raise their hand with the feature. Um, and then also you can put in the chat. And can you um can you tell us a little bit more about your upcoming insect book? Yeah, so that book is called um Insect Safari, Exploring Exotic Everyday Books That Are Hidden in Plain Sight. And um I'm almost done writing it, so it's not going to be 
uh, you know, available for at least a couple of years. But um, I, I've, I've just had so much fun working on it because I've, I've uh, found all the amazing, um, you know, insects that I didn't even realize were right there in my backyard just by uh, paying attention to them and uh, taking photos and then having people on iNaturalist help me identify them. So I think within the first summer um, of doing this, I found over 200 insects. And and th then I was even more astonished about what I was learning about the insects. You know, they have these incredible uh, anatomies and physiologies and superpowers and stuff. So um, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing my wonder about insects with everybody else once the book gets published. Thanks for asking. I think we have Holly has a question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, lovely presentation, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I am up in Holton um, chiming in uh, on your talk and part of what drew me to it was I am in question around creating a photo kind of book myself. Mm -hmm. um, very beginning stages, I've taken thousands of photos with my phone. Yeah. Do. And um, I'm wondering if you can speak to um, what you learned in terms of the creation of um, just, I mean, one of the hardest parts I'm finding is which photos, especially with yeah. you know, sun sunsets and sunrises. So in terms of really, you know, capturing, um, but not just that, but in the creation of the book, it seems like you self-published and how you came to um, creating your end product. And if you could just speak to anything that you feel might be valuable for someone like me who's in the creation mode and exploring that. Sure. So um, before I, I got my um, photo book uh, published, I, uh, I did a, a version of it on Blurb. It was like my pandemic project. And um, so that's, I don't know if you're familiar with Blurb, but there's sites like that that make it very easy for you to create your own book. So that's one thing that you could consider if you want to self-publish. Um, I uh, was fortunate to already have a book published with Down East Books, so they were interested in, in uh, me publishing the photo book. But I hear it's really hard to get a, a photo book published. Um, and, um, so you might, that's why I'm thinking you might want to consider self-publishing. Um, you can even sell your books, uh, when you self-publish easily online. Um, although I, I haven't done that personally, so I can't really speak to that. Um, as for the creation of the book, I, I think I had 10,000 photos that I had to wade through and decide which ones to keep for the book. And fortunately, I, I have a good friend who's got a good eye. She's a, my friend, uh, Carolyn Adler, who's a, uh, fellow, a fellow artist. And um, so <laughs> she helped me. We we sat down together and spent several days at different sessions where, we, you know, well, what about this one? Well, what about that one? And <laughs> everything. But what I found helpful in reviewing all my photos was realizing that I was consistently taking photos of, you know, the same 10 basic things, you know, which are the main features and main and the main chapters of my book. So so I think, you know, that that's the first step is just sort of organizing the chapters that you want to uh, have based on what you tend to take photos of. Um, and then, of course, you know, you'll have to whittle it away and and, uh, and it's a painful process. Does that help answer your question? It does. Yeah, um, I, I do appreciate think through um, the chapter piece. Um, yeah, I hadn't even thought about the concept of chapters in a photo book. So. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, great. great. We have some more questions in the chat. Jane asks if you used an iPhone for your underwater photos or did you use an adapter? I used an, an iPhone and they weren't underwater. I just took them through the water. So, you know, there are special cameras that are made for going underwater and I've never tried those. I just used the iPhone and, and, and took it from the surface, you know, looking down through the water. And Steve asks, um, how long have you been using the iPhone primarily, and do you have issues in sub-zero temperatures? Uh, yeah, so have I ever taken pictures in sub-zero? I don't think so. I mean, I've taken pictures in the teens and, the, and stuff, but not... Um, 
uh, probably below zero. So I can't really answer that one um, because they are, you know, heat sensitive to the touch. So I imagine it would be a problem. Um, and how long have I used it um, exclusively? I want to say um, 10, 12 years. Great. And we also have a question from Jeff. Um, do you print your photos individually? And if so, what type of printer do you use? No, I don't have a, a good printer um, to do that. So um, actually, before I uh, created my book, which required me to also um, uh, do some exhibits of my photos, most of my photos just existed on my um, uh, phone and, and computer, and I didn't really get to see them in the flesh. Um, and, and that's what was so exciting about getting the book published and having these exhibits. But um, for my exhibits, um, I used uh, a, a person who does framing and printing near, near me in Philadelphia, and he has um, really nice papers that he uses, and, uh, and he's, he's just got a lot more experience on and a better machinery than anything I could put together. And um, yeah, Celeste, you know, appreciated hearing you talk about your experiences in nature and the creative process, putting the book together. And Dan, um, he, he asks, um, would you compare the quality of images taken with the iPhone versus high end digital pocket cameras? Yeah, um, I think that the high-end digital cameras might enable you to blow things up more um, and with more resolution than the iPhone, but the iPhone keeps getting better at this. Um, and I was really amazed because for my exhibit, I blew up um, like that picture of the grasshopper so, um, and, and some of these close-ups to, I think they were uh, 16... 16 by 20 or, you know, or, or 16 by 10 or something like anyhow, they were big photos and, and it still had very good resolution. So, um, I, you know, it all depends on what model iPhone you have and they just keep getting better. And I hear that some of the other smartphones are quite good, like Samsung and, uh, and the Android. Great. And, um, and Richard is pitching to the audience that Margie's doing a presentation on her book on February 29th via Zoom. And there's a link there to register. Oh, we have yes. Thank you. Yeah. And Miranda asks, what software do you use for editing the photos? I use the uh, photo editing software that comes with the um, camera and the Mac. Um, and uh, I have it set up so all my photos go onto the cloud. So anything I take on my photo will go into my computer, which is a Mac. Um, and then um, I, it, you know, I find it easier to edit on a bigger screen like my laptop as opposed to doing it on my phone. But sometimes if I don't have it available, I'll still do it on my phone. And I, and that editing software has gotten quite good over the years and then allows you to do much uh, of what you can do with some of the ones that you have to, you know, pay for that are separate like Lightroom. I mean, it's not quite as good, but but it's it's sufficient, I find. All right, great. And we have a final question from Barbara. Do you take your pictures in raw format? No, um, I don't bother because, uh, you know, it takes up a lot of space. And I I find that taking it without that, I still am able to blow it up to the size that I need to exhibit it. So I suppose if I wanted to do a huge poster or something, I would consider it. But I never have the need for um, such a, a large format. Um, for the most part. So I haven't uh, bothered with the raw. Thank, thank you so much, Margie, for this. This has been inspirational and it's a remarkable book. Oh, great. Well, I hope it inspires people out there to go out and, and use their phones and smartphone uh, and point and shoots to take pictures because they, they really do a good job. All right. well, Hi, yeah. Margie. Um, it's Brooke from Philly. I have uh, a quick question for you, actually. Yeah. Um, can you, um, I was wondering what the ideal format for, uh, for you for presenting your photos would be like, do you prefer to show a whole bunch of them in a room or do you prefer to have them presented as a book? 
Um, <laughs> or do you guess, see that as sort of two different things? Yeah, they're kind of two different things. Um, I mean, I th I think when you exhibit them, it, it makes certain people aware of them, then they wouldn't if, uh, come across the, the book and vice versa. So I, I guess they, they each have their um, virtues. And um, uh, but for me, it, it was rewarding to see them in the flesh <laughs> and, um, and, and in a big size. Oh, sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. And yeah, thanks again, Margie. This has been great. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Take care. Bye.